now time to take a short look at uh, some of the ways that these Nephilim progeny, the descendants of the Atlanteans, have controlled the masses of mankind and how they've gone about activating this great ritual to their dark archons. One of the most powerful Freemasonic symbols is seen here on the left, and it is called the cross and the crown. Around that image we see in Latin, in hoc signe victae, which is in the sign I will conquer, attributed to the Emperor Constantine, one of the founders of Christianity. The cross and the crown. Now, the first international banking empire was created by the Knights Templar with their exploits during the Crusades. Martin Luther's 16th century Protestant Reformation was largely funded by the emerging merchant and banking classes of Germany who sought to wrest financial control from the papacy. It's also interesting to note that if you go to Wittenberg or you go to Worms and you go and look at the original uh, documents of Martin Luther, you'll find that on the leather-bound covers you'll see the rose cross, the symbols of the Rosicrucians. So here is the person purported to be the founder of a modern Christian religion, and yet he's funded by secret societies and even has their logos on the front covers of his books. The exact same logos that later turn up on the American dollar bill and on the Tudor dynasty. The church exerted a complete stranglehold over all forms of intellectual life and education from early on in its unholy alliance with Rome until the 12th century. The respect for education that was one of the great distinguishing characteristics of the classical Roman Empire was swept away. This is Tim Wallace Murphy in his book Ross Lynn speaking about the coming of the Dark Ages. Thomas Jefferson also says, the clergy converted the simple teachings of Jesus into an engine for enslaving the world and adulterated by artificial constructions into a connivance to filch wealth and power to themselves. These clergy, in fact, constitute the real Antichrist. At the top of the crown of the Queen of England, we find the Malta Cross. The Queen is the head of the Knights of Malta, another secret society. And the Nazis, of course, used also the Malta Cross. But this is a very ancient device. The Nazis also used the oak leaves, the skull and bones of the pirates, and the eagle, the old Habsburg symbol, the old skull and bone symbol of the uh, Knights Templar, the Knights of Malta Cross, and the oak leaves of the ancient Druids. Now one might ask, what on earth, again, in the military, in something that has to do with mass death and mass casualty, what are oak leaves doing on the lapels? We find oak leaves around the hats of the French military. We find them on the lapels of the Russian military. In fact, we find acorns on the hats of the cavalry of the United States of America. Ancient Druidic bardic symbols of theological elites now found on the uniforms of the military mass murderers of the world. That's right. The reason is, as I said, if you're going to sacrifice somebody to the macrobes, you have to mock them for death. You not only have to send a person to the right ritualistic place, but you have to have them dressed for the, the ritual. The virgin must be dressed for the ritual. They must be mocked for death. So you put a bunch of occult symbols on them and send them out to die. The individual just looks in the mirror and thinks they look damn good, but they don't realize what these occult symbols mean. The ribbons and the bells and the whistles and the badges and the emblems of state, the coins, the flags, all the heraldry. It has a meaning in occult theocracy. In America, we have the Ku Klux Klan. This word originally comes from the Greek, kuklos, which meant the Knights of the Golden Circle. Now, the Grand Master refers to himself as the dragon. They wear the Knights of Malta cross. They burn crosses, wear white robes like the Knights Templar, and have a racist ideology. And we'll be coming back to the Ku Klux Klan a little bit later. Now, we see the Knights of Malta cross together with the symbol of the dove on the maces of the Queen of England. And it turns out that the Spanish or old word for dove is columb. And that's why we have the District of Columbia, Columbia Pictures and Records, Columbia Shuttle, all the drugs coming from Columbia, South America. We have British Columbia and we have Christopher Columbus. But the word Columbus means the doves. 
The Knights of Columbus is a secret fraternity run by the Queen of England. It does not represent the Holy Spirit. If we look today on the Visa credit cards on the right-hand side, you'll see the little symbol of the dove. And people never ask, what does this symbol, this so-called holy symbol that's meant to represent the Holy Spirit, what's it doing on the credit cards? Well, it is a dove, but it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It has to do with a secret fraternity known as the Knights of Columbus. The Knights of Malta Cross is also known as the Black Sun. And of course, the Black Sun is the symbol of the Smithsonian Institute in America. And the swastika was even referred to by the Nazis as a black sun. Himmler never got tired of calling the Nazis an order, a lodge, a black lodge. Now the Anunnaki, which is the ancient Sumerian word for the fallen angels, is very close to the word Nazi. One of the eight children of the mother goddess, Ninharsag, Naz, was also refers to Canis Major, a constellation that Sirius occupies. Again, Jesus of Nazareth, from Nasir, meaning Sirius. The Knights of Malta Cross is seen here on the picture on the left in ancient Pictish. These are the Picts of Scotland using not only the serpent, not only the swastika, but the Knights of Malta Cross. A very ancient symbol. But the fact that we see it here with the serpent is very suggestive. Here again we see it on ancient lances of the Teutonic peoples. Now of course, just like the old uh, Atlanteans, we have the Nazis being very interested in the concept of race and eugenics and genetics in polygamy and population control. We also have the phenomena of Siamese twins and midgets and deformities and blemishes and the extra nipple and whatnot. Witches were burned for their blemishes. We have congenital hemophilia. We have the ritual of bonding by blood. We have freaks, the whole concept of the Siamese twins that comes down to us. It just put down to us as being freakish, you know, individuals, strange mutations. But could these not be throwbacks to genetic manipulations and genetic uh, experiments that were being done not too far back in our Earth history? Now, Charles Darwin, who wrote Origin of the Species, what we often don't realize is the full title of that book. The full title was Origin of the Species and the Preservation of the Favored Races. Charles Darwin was also funded by occultists, specifically the Royal Academy. Now, Herbert Spencer, the philosopher, while Darwin got the credit, the leading proponent of this chilling racial evolutionary theory was Herbert Spencer, whose ideas were based on race. Spencer was more explicit than Darwin in his conclusion. Only one race was capable of ascending to the highest levels of the evolutionary spiral. The others would be left behind. So here we have an occult agenda, an occult agenda of blood, of race, and of mass murder. Because remember, the pontifications of philosophers in the 19th century and of the 20th century are being carried out, they're being implemented in the world. The Nazis implementing occult theocracies coming from occult societies like the Thule Society and the Freemasons and the occultists of the ancient world, Ordo Templi Orientis. And in America and Britain, it's no different. The Knights Templar, the Knights of Columbus, the Freemasons. The Nazis are steeped, as anyone who studies their symbolism can see, in occultism. They often refer to themselves as the Order of the Black Sun. The official historians now generally accept that occult orders, some very ancient and some new, were operating behind the Nazi party and other political parties in Germany. The same historians seem conspicuously reluctant, however, to transpose these facts to the British and American political milieu even when ample evidence exists to prove it, and even when many of the elites of the European occult orders, plus industrialists, publishers, and scholars, were related to international aristocratic families and dynasties. It is a fact that the Vatican helped Hitler to gain power and then helped him to consolidate his grip on Germany. This was done in part by advising the Catholic Party of Germany to vote for the Nazi candidates. The Third Reich is the first power which not only recognizes, but puts into practice 
the high principles of the papacy. This is Franz von Papen, second only in command to Adolf Hitler, is literally telling you that the Third Reich is implementing the principles of the Vatican, the principles of the papacy. But who are the papacy officiating for? Now, of course, when we talk here in programs like this about the Vatican, please understand that we're not talking about Roman Catholicism as a religion. There's a very great difference between Roman Catholicism as a practicing religion and Vatican, the institution of Catholicism, the institution of the Vatican, the nation state, the state within a state. These are two completely different animals here. Behind one of the great thinkers and uh, philosophers, behind the Nazi party, close friend to Rudolf Hess and to Adolf Hitler was Karl Hosshofer. He created what is known as geostrategical theory. He propounded it and he was the teacher of Rudolf Hess and Rudolf Hess introduced uh, Haushofer to Adolf Hitler. It's a very important uh, character to study. In the Origins and Oracles series, we have uh, a program called Evil's Willing Servants, and we go into a little bit of Haushofer's background. It makes very interesting listening. One of the most powerful occult societies uh, behind the politics of Germany was called the Thule Society, or the Thule Society. Founded in 1912 by Rudolf von Zumbottendorf, a major Freemason, an expert in Islamic and Oriental mysticism. In 1918, Thule member Karl Harrier forms the Workers' Political Circle, and in 1919, he renames that the German Workers' Party, later headed by Adolf Hitler, who took over from mystic Dietrich Eckhart. It became the Nazi Party. Now, the word Thule, or Thule, means northerly place or homeland and it refers to Atlantis. Again, one of the thinkers uh, specifically beloved by Adolf Hitler was called Horg Lanz, one of the most important of all Nazi ideologists. Horg Lanz von Liebenfels was an ex-Cistercian monk who, publicized, who published the magazine Ostara. After being expelled from his monastery, he formed his own Order of the New Templars, Adolf Hitler and other Nazis collected and read Ostara and thought of Lanz as a veritable guru. There's the front cover of Ostara, and as you can see, clearly shown there, is a Knights Templar. Now, the master race, as they referred themselves to, these terms, we've become so enamored to them, we don't even think anymore what they really mean. Master race. Who are the racialists? Who are those who control the genes of mankind? Who are those who try to separate and segregate the human race based on genetics? and eugenics and racial hygiene. Who were the original ones? We see only the Nazis. They are a modern rendition of this ancient problem. They were Satanists who practiced black magic, says Traver Ravenscroft, author of The Spear of Destiny. This means that they were solely concerned with raising their consciousness by means of rituals to awareness of evil and non-human intelligences in the universe and with achieving means of communication with these intelligences. Now, closer to home, when the tomb of Yale University, that's the tomb of the Skull and Bones secret fraternity, was raided by Christian students, the decor was almost purely Nazi in nature. Maltese crosses, swastikas, and so on were found therein. And the number 322, which is the lodge of the Skull and Bones Society, is actually the German lodge number of this fraternity. It is controlled by German secret societies such as the Illuminati and the OTO and the Thule. And Joel Bakan, in his fine book, The Corporation, says, In its July 1934 issue, Fortune magazine extolled the virtues of fascism and the economic miracles wrought by Mussolini. Lord Goldsboro, the man who produced the issue, wrote, The good journalist must recognize in fascism certain ancient virtues of the race, whether or not they happen to be fashionable in his own country. So there we have it. Ties between modern American industrialists and politicians and ancient societies and German occultists. Now, have we been told all along that the ritual sacrifices have been going on? Let's look at the etymology. We've been told that there's a new clear war. We've been told that there's an atomic war. What do these words actually refer to? 
What does the word nuclear or nucleus actually refer to? What does the word atomic actually refer to? Does it really refer to reds under the beds and SDI and bombs dropping at you from the skies? Or is it something much closer to home, something slightly more biological, something more of a cold war, one that would never heat up at all? And what are the Star Wars? And now that the ritual centers have been designed and built, and now that the masses of the population live in the cities of the world, the next stage is easy. All the unrest, all the slaughter, all the mayhem, all the bloodletting, from the Holocaust to the assassinations. Uh, we have in Ireland, for instance, tremendous unrest there, constant unrest in Palestine, in Guyana, in Waco, in Heaven's Gate, in Columbine, Columbine school disaster, in Oklahoma city bombing, or the Twin Towers or the Gulf War. All these traumas visited upon members of the human race. In Waco, the great comedian Bill Hicks said, if child molestation is actually your concern, then how come we don't see Bradley tanks knocking down Catholic churches? Now, since the Second World War, the U.S. has bombed 250 countries. That's actually since 1948, which was the time of the creation of the United Nations. Anthony J. Hilder of Radio Free World says there have been more wars since the creation of the United Nations in 1948 than from the beginning of time up until 1948. Now, who are the United Nations and were they really created to uh, instigate peace in the world anyway? Well, their history is that they were previously called the League of Nations and they came into existence through Roosevelt's uh, Bretton Woods Agreement. But before they were called the League of Nations, they were called the League to Enforce the Peace. Previous to that, they were called the American Society for the Judicial Settlement of International Disputes. Now, this society was created in 1920 by Theodore Marburg, and its first chairman was William Howard Taft of the Skull and Bones Society. Secretaries of War of the U.S. are commonly Skull and Bones members right up to the modern day. And Geneva is home to the League of Nations and to the Bilderberger Group. Concerning the slaughter and mayhem, Count Leo Tolstoy, the great author, said that government is an association of men who do violence to the rest of us. How right he is. And Manly Palmer Hall, one of America's greatest and most beloved occultists, also a 33rd degree Mason, puts it this way. To repress rebellion is to maintain the status quo a condition which binds the mortal creature in a state of intellectual or physical slavery. But it is impossible to chain man merely by slaving his body. The mind must also be held, and to accomplish this, fear is the accepted weapon. The common man must fear life, fear death, fear God, and fear devil, and fear most his overlords, the keepers of his destiny. So it goes for urban life. And now Aldous Huxley, in his book, The Final Revolution, one of the people very much in to control of the masses, writes, there will be, in the next generation or so, a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude and producing dictatorships without tears, so to speak. Producing a kind of painless concentration camp for entire societies so that people will, in fact, have their liberties taken away from them, but will rather enjoy it because they will be distracted from any desire to rebel by propaganda, brainwashing, or brainwashing enhanced by pharmacological methods. And this seems to be the final revolution. That's right. As the Nazis had a final solution for their victims, so these thinkers and potentates and politicians, they're working on the final solution for the rest of us. But we're going to enjoy it, of course. Now, one of the major occultists in Europe was called Count Cagliostro, and he was one of the individuals also working on the Stargate problem. His real name was Giuseppe Balsamo, and he was a ruthless and a very enigmatic character. And being a Freemason, 
He actually invented one of Freemasonry's rites. It's called Cagliostro's Egyptian Rite. But this involved a virginal boy or girl as an oracle or even as a priest. And these virgins were known in Masonic circles as the Kulumb or the Doves. So here we have Cagliostro's Egyptian Rite, a rite that involves virginal boys or girls in the form of the priest or the oracle. But they're known by the name the Doves. And the Spanish for that is Kulumb. So anybody remember Columbine High School and the sacrifice of the young children there? Were they oracles too in some sort of Masonic rite? We have Applewhite and the priesthood of Saturn. Saturnian symbolism is also very prevalent in Freemasonry. And this particular Heaven's Gate cult, the very word Heaven's Gate, we already looked earlier at Saturn and the Gate of the South, which is a correspondence of death. And the fact that they wore black attire and the Nike logo. The Nike logo is actually the corner of the rings of Saturn. And the fact that the men in Heaven's Gate were castrated Anyone who studied ancient mythology knows that Saturn and the sickle of Saturn and the castration of his father Uranus, all of these symbols coming out of the ancient world. Now large doses of fear, trepidation and agony were released during the 9-11 episode, not only from New York but all over the world. This event was staged at the site of a powerful vortex or synchronic line. So yes, as part of the great rituals and traumas, we're not going to have just one event. We're going to have assassinations. We're going to have murders. We're going to have rapes and serial crimes. We're going to have Zodiac killers and Green River killers and night stalkers and all kinds of disaster. We're going to have children uh, burned up with CS gas at Waco and all other manner of atrocities that one could possibly think of that the human mind and its depravity could come up with. 9-11 is just one of those events. But any of these vents, if they're situated at the right place and at the right time, create waves that permeate into the earth grid and permeate the lives of individuals. That's what cities were originally designed for. There's nothing natural about a city. There's nothing natural about living in one. Assassinations like that of Diana, the moon goddess, on August 31st. And August 31st is the period when the constellation known as Virgo descends beneath the horizon. So the Virgin descending beneath the horizon signifies the time of sacrifice. In fact, August 31st, 100 years prior, was when Jack the Ripper killed his first virgin or his first whore. Another ritual sacrifice. November 22nd, 1963. At Sagittarius, the point of Sagittarius, the famous 13th sign of the Zodiac, is the assassination of John F. Kennedy at the junction of three roads on November 22nd. That's 11 for November and 22 for the day. That's 33. He was also shot at the 33rd meridian of the earth at the junction of three roads. And he was murdered at the period between the signs of Sagittarius and Scorpio. And this is known as the 13th sign of the zodiac. Only those who study the occult, esoteric form of astrology know this, the famous 13th sign of the zodiac. And the secret society or the, actually the secret bodyguard, the secret um, police of, meant to be protecting John F. K. referred to him by the code name the Traveler. But in fact, that's an ancient mythological name. Exactly at the point when the sun god descends into the underworld, he was known in all ancient times as the traveler. Speaking of this kind of geometry, Graham Hancock and Robert Boval write, the geographical latitude of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount lies between the 31st and 32nd degree parallels with the latter passing just south of the holy city. It has also been remarked that the mother lodge of the Scottish Rite Supreme Council of the 33rd degree was located in the city of Charleston in South Carolina, probably because the 33rd degree parallel passes right through it. So even though it may seem strange, even preposterous to us, 
These secret societies pay attention, not only the sidereal time, not only the calendar dates, not only the movement of the luminaries and the stars, but also to the degrees of longitude and latitude of the earth, from the dropping of the atom bomb, to assassinations here, to openings of buildings there. These sidereal times are very, very important, as the great scholars are now starting to find out. And this particular thing about the 33rd meridian, why are so many of the world's banks, why are so many of the world's wars, why are so many of the stately homes of the world, and specifically the banks, are situated in the 30th, between the 30th and 33rd parallel of the earth. But we have wars and we have rumors of wars, and we have endless anxiety. Large doses of fear and confusion make excellent business, especially for the pharmaceutical monopolies. Consumption of antidepressants rose dramatically after the attack on the World Trade Center. As Emperor Caligula is meant to have said, let them hate us as long as they fear us. Fear, of course, as Huxley and as Manly Palmer Hall are saying, is the best way to control. Since love and fear can hardly exist together, says Machiavelli, and if we must choose between them, it is far safer to be feared than loved. So this is the kind of mentality in these new Atlanteans, the ones who seek to control us and keep us roped in, dumbed down, ignorant, impoverished, not to be made privy to what the masters are doing behind the scenes, behind the veil of government and national security. Now, F.T. Marinetti is a great study when it comes to studying uh, mania the founder of the Italian Futurism and a lifelong fascist. He was also one of the most influential personages in the history of modern art. In his futuristic or futurist manifesto of 1909, he says, war is beautiful because it initiates the dreamt of metalization of the human body. War is beautiful because it enriches a flowering meadow with fiery orchids of machine guns. War is beautiful because it combines the gunfire, the cannonades, the ceasefire, the sense, and the stench of putrefaction into a symphony. We will glorify war, the world's only hygiene. Militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom brings beautiful ideas worth dying for and scorn for women. We will destroy the museums, libraries, ac academies of every kind. We will fight moralism, feminism, every opportunistic or utilitarian cowardice. Makes one think of... Uh, the movie Dr. Strangelove, this kind of mania loose in the world. Not some psychotic, though. Not somebody who's been locked up in a, you know, asylum somewhere. These are the top thinkers of the world. People whose thoughts and manifestos change how we think and act. Herman Kahn, in his On Thermonuclear War in 1960, calmly considers whether or not a death toll of 50 million human beings would be an acceptable, quote-unquote, statistic to ensure that democracy prevails. Jordan Maxwell and some other scholars who study the astrological cycles and chart what these evil archies are up to, and once you know what they're into, then you can sort of follow what they're up to and get ahead of the game. We come to understand that we're in what we call the Saturnalian period, or what they call the Saturnalian period when chaos and debauchery is permissible. We're in what the Hindus call the Kal Age, and what also might be called the Dionysian Age, when all forms of debauchery and depravity are let loose upon the world. This is the period when all kinds of virtue and morality, as the ancient texts were saying, are thought of as vices. Julian Huxley, in the preface to Brave New World, says, as political and economic freedom diminishes, Sexual freedom tends to compensatingly increase, and the dictator will do well to encourage that freedom, in conjunction with the freedom to daydream under the influence of dope, movies, and radio. It will help to reconcile his subjects to their servitude, which is not their fate. In Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, he writes, Sensual pleasures programmed into people as infants through hypnopedic messages repeated thousands of times as they slept. These messages encouraged sexual promiscuity, attendance at mass entertainments, and the ingestion of drugs for any and every unpleasant feeling or little distress. You know, the idea here is not to have people actually have more sex, but to engender frustration that they're not able to. 
In George Orwell's 1984, An Animal Farm, he says, the past is completely eliminated. History is revised. Books are destroyed. Without print media, there is no evidence that anything has been different. Even keeping diaries is forbidden. People are expected to absorb and accept the new information delivered by the television sets, even if it directly contradicts the month, the news of a month ago. Since it is impossible to prove the contradiction, it is useless to try to resist. And is this not the exact situation we find ourselves in today, where people not only believe the media, but in believing it, they're filled with contradictions. But who stands up to write those contradictions? If something on the media repeats and repeats and repeats the same message, eventually 80% of the population just blithely accept it. In the book Being Human we read, when faced with a life-threatening situation, the reptilian hind brain, the most primitive part of the human brain, switches off all activity except that which keeps us alive. It sends the subconscious message, do not move, breathe or blink, or you will be seen and attacked. But as Hesiod and the ancient Greek playwright in 8th century BC, he writes, the gods keep mankind ignorant of the ways of living, else one would do enough in one day to last a year. In Job 12, the Bible, we read, He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. In Job 12, He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light and him maketh to stagger like a drunken man. So we have it in the age of Dionysus, the Kal Age. And who are the philosophers who brought this about? Well, Thomas Malthus, in his own words, says, in his essay on population, instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. We should crowd more people into the houses and court the return of the plague. But above all, we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases. And those benevolent but mistaken men who have thought that they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. If by these and similar means the annual mortality were increased, we might possibly, every one of us, marry at the age of puberty and yet few be absolutely starved. When we come to eugenics and Charles Darwin, Darwin he writes in his own words, excepting in the case of man himself, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. Eugenics, which was selective breeding or racial hygiene, is not, however, a Nazi or a German phenomena, but a British and American one. Hundreds of people were systemically and legally sterilized in the United States uh, from 1907 on. The most influential eugenicist was Sir Francis Galton, the cousin of Charles Darwin. He was an honorary president of the Eugenics Society for several years. His successor was Major Leonard Darwin, son of Charles Darwin. And it was he who strongly promoted the eradication of the unfit. The first U.S. Eugenics Society was headed by Avril Harriman's mother. It was also funded by the royals, as was the entire Harriman dynasty. Ernst Rudin, Hitler's eugenics expert and chief engineer was a guest of Mrs. Harriman in America before the advent of the Second World War. In 1905, Dr. Ernst Rudin founded a German eugenics society called the Society for Racial Hygiene. Later, he changed his name, changed the name, adding the word suggested by Francis Galton, the Society for Racial Hygiene, that is, eugenics. In 1925, Leonard Darwin wrote an article for the Journal of the Eugenics Society, the Eugenics Review pushing the idea of locking up everyone whose genes might be considered defective. To save the human race, he said, force or compulsion would be necessary in many cases. He promoted a policy that he called segregation, but he did not mean segregating whites from blacks. He meant separating the fit from the unfit. Compulsion is now permitted if applying to criminals, lunatics, and mental defectives. And this principle must be extended to all who, by having offspring, would seriously damage future generations, he argued. 
the leaders of the progressive movement in Britain also supported negative eugenics. The people who had founded the London School of Economics at Sydney and Beatrice Webb were also leaders of the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society later became one of Britain's major political parties, the Labour Party. As early as 1909, the Fabians, led by the Webbs, said, what we as eugenicists have got to do is to scrap the old poor law with its indiscriminate relief of the destitute as such and replace it by an intelligent policy of so altering the social environment as to discourage or prevent the multiplication of those irrevocably below the national minimum of fitness. In 1930, a Fabian leader, Archibald Church, introduced a bill for eugenic sterilization. So here we have the Fabians, here we have top politicians, here we have the founder of evolution theory, the elites of British society, deciding who will live and who will not, and the manner in which they will administer the torture to the unfit. The Fabian Society itself was founded in 1883 and played a catalytic role preaching the inevitability of gradualness in the movement towards a socialist society, taking their name from the Roman warrior Fabius, who learned to wait patiently before striking a fatal blow against Hannibal. In America, John Foster Dulles, Senator and Secretary of State under Eisenhower, has this to say, it is only by eliminating the lower members of the human race that the higher average is maintained. And Jacques Cousteau, UNESCO courier, on November 1991 said, the United Nations goal is to reduce population selectively by encouraging abortion, first sterilization, and control human reproduction, and regards two-thirds of the human population as access baggage, with 350,000 people to be eliminated per day. And the master of them all, Bertrand Russell, in his impact of science on society, had this to say, at present, the population of the world is increasing at about 58,000 per diem. War so far has had no very great effect on this increase, which continued throughout each of the world wars. War has hitherto been disappointing in this respect, but perhaps bacteriological war may prove effective. If a black death could spread throughout the world in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. The state of affairs might be unpleasant, but what of it? We have Prince Philip, quoted in the Ducha Press Agentur in August 1988, said, In the event I am reborn, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. Now, the Institute of Human Virology we read that according to top pharmacologist, Dr. Robert B. Strecker, MD, PhD, the leading scientist of the project, that AIDS virus was created at Fort Dietrich, but was based on research first conducted at the Lebedev Institute near Moscow, which was founded by the world's leading virologist, Gervich. The number of those infected doubles every month. Over 23 million Americans are already affected. In the Strecker Memorandum, in the 30s and 40s, the Public Health Service openly experimented and monitored black men infected with syphilis in Tuskegee, Alabama. Even after Palestinian was discovered, these men remained infected and were not treated. Hence, their wives and sons were likewise infected. These incidents are recorded in detail in the book Bad Blood by James Jones. Between 1959 and 1970, there were over 300 biological experiments conducted on U.S. citizens unbeknownst to them. The extent of the program is revealed in the book, A Higher Form of Killing, by Paxman and Harris. That's from Dr. Robert Strecker's The Strecker Memorandum. Now here it is on DVD. This doctor, Dr. Robert Strecker, conclusively proves that AIDS was vector-borne, that AIDS was a man-made designer disease to create havoc in the world, exactly according to the policies of Bertrand Russell and Aldous Huxley and his coterie. This is absolute compulsory viewing. The Strecker Memorandum by Dr. Robert Strecker. He was one of the first people to work on the AIDS virus and knows everything there is to know about it. In The Final Revolution, Aldous Huxley says, 
It seems to me perfectly in the cards that a euphoric drug, far more efficient and less harmful than alcohol, may be produced. And if this should be introduced into every bottle of Coca-Cola, then clearly, as I ventured to point out more than 25 years ago in Brave New World, this would become an incredibly powerful instrument in the hands of a dictator. What is becoming, I think, quite clear now is that dictatorships of the future probably will not be based on terror as the dictatorships of Hitler and Stalin. Terror is an extremely wasteful, stupid, and inefficient method of controlling people. In Brave New World, the distribution of this mysterious drug, which I call the Soma, was a plank in the political platform. A Dr. Wright refers to inoculation against smallpox in the British Isles as an ancient practice. And a citizen of Wales, aged 99 years old, states that inoculations have been known and used during his entire lifetime, but that she got smallpox through her inoculation. In Birmingham, England, from 1871 to 1874, there were 7,706 cases of smallpox. Out of these, 6,795 had been vaccinated against the disease. A select committee of the Privy Council convened to inquire into the Vaccination Act of 1867, as 97.5% of those vaccinated died of the disease. Now, Dr. Charles Crichton, in 1884, he is asked to write an article for the Encyclopedia Britannica on vaccination. After much research internationally, he concludes that vaccination constituted a gross superstition. In 1896, Italian professor Carlo Ruta states that vaccination is a worldwide delusion at an unscientific practice with consequences measured today with tears and sorrow without end. Joseph Lister introduced sanitation to the surgery and hospital, but was fiercely resisted by leading surgeons and doctors. The British Medical Association dedicated itself to attacking his name, reputation, and theories. In 1850, a British physician reads a paper uh, detailing the microscopic examination of food products, revealing that all food products examined in Britain were adulterated with foreign substances, including chemicals. W.B. Clark from the New York Press in 1909 says, cancer was practically unknown until the cowpox vaccination began to be introduced. He says, I have seen 200 cases of cancer, and I never saw a case of cancer in an unvaccinated person. On the question of fluoride, in 1943, researchers from the U.S. Public Health Service examined the health of the residents of Bartlett, Texas, to see if the eight parts per million of fluoride in their drinking water was affecting their health. It was checked again in 1953. They find that the death rate in Bartlett was three times higher than a neighboring town which contained only 0.4 parts per million of the fluoride. Dr. James W. Wardner, in his book Unholy Alliances, says, the London Office of Strategic Affairs, that's the OSS from which the, developed the CIA, was run by David K. E. Bruce, an employee of Avril Harriman from the 1920s. Through Bruce and other connections, Avril Harriman dominated all American intelligence functions in wartime Britain. David Bruce was the husband of a Pittsburgh Mellon heiress. Alan Dulles had been the player for the Mellon's big international oil ventures, and eventually the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell took over the management of the entire Mellon family fortune. It was through the Mellons that fluoride began to be promoted and dispensed into the America's water supply. Now, Ghislaine Langtak, in her book, The Medical Mafia, writes, at a CIA hearing, Dr. Gottlieb, a cancerologist, admitted having dispersed in 1960 a large quantity of viruses in the Congo River in Zaire to pollute and contaminate all the people who used the river as their source of water. Dr. Gottlieb was named to be the head of the National Cancer Institute. Francois Mitterrand, the president of France, says, the health of citizens is a commodity which is bought and sold. And mind control advocate Dr. Jose Delgado, in his book, Physical Control of the Mind Towards a Psycho-Civilized Society, simply puts it this way, man does not have the right to develop his own mind. Now, the annual death toll from synthetic prescription drugs 
both from the correctly prescribed and the incorrectly prescribed, amounts to about 231,000 deaths every year. To put this into perspective, this is the equivalent of a World Trade Center disaster every week for over a year and a half, or the crash of two fully loaded 747 aircraft every day of the year. Drug deaths caused by physicians, the third leading cause of death in the United States. It is far ahead of accidents, drunk driving, homicides, airline accidents, as well as all other disease. Jimmy Carter says, doctors collectively have done more to block adequate medical care for people of this country than any other single group. And Linus Pauling, the Nobel laureate, says, everyone should know that the war on cancer is largely a fraud. Now it turns out that the term or word Medici, this is refers to the 13th century Florentine patrician family who became one of the most powerful bankers as well as patrons of the arts and who provided many tyrannical popes. This word, the Medici, actually comes from that meaning medical doctors. So again, here we have the old age-old connection coming down from the Venetians, coming down from the Phoenicians, coming down from the ancient Sumerians. We have the families related, descended by blood from these ancient sources. And they're still up to their business, right down into modern times, massacring, creating rituals, treating people as if they're just cattle ready for sacrifice. Alice Bailey, an occultist and head of the Lucius Trust, she says, behind the division of humanity stand those enlightened ones whose right and privilege it is to watch over human evolution and to guide the destinies of men. This they do through the implanting of ideas in the minds of the world thinkers, so that these ideas in due time receive recognition and eventually become controlling factors in human life. They train the members of the new group of world servers in the task of changing these ideas into ideals. These in turn become the desired objectives of the thinkers and are then taught to the powerful middle class and worked up into world forms of governments or religion, thus forming the basis of the new world order. And Sidney West, the leader of the Fabian Society that later became the Labour Party of England, has this to say about the whole gig. To play those millions of minds, to watch them slowly respond to unseen stimulus, to guide their aspirations without their knowledge, all this, whether in high capacities or in humble, is a big and endless game of chess of ever extraordinary excitement. So-called philanthropist John D. Rockefeller, in his occasional letter number one of the General Educational Board, has this to say, In our dreams we have limitless resources, and people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. Unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill on a grateful and responsive rule of folk. The task we set before ourselves is a very beautiful one, to train these people as we find them to a perfectly ideal life just where they are. And Major John Rawling Reese of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, a major mind control syndicate in England, says this, the patient must remain unaware of the specific intentions and purposes of the doctor administrating the treatment. Building a society in which it is possible for any member of any social group to be treated without resort to legal means, and even if they do not desire such treatment. It should be clear by now, at this stage, that we have in fact an official history and we have an occult history, a occult history of the world, occult history of the ancient world. And we also have a cult history of America. Arthur S. Miller of George Washington University says, those who formally rule take their signals and commands not from the electorate as a body, but from a small group of men plus a few women. This group will be called the establishment. It exists even though that existence is stoutly denied. It is one of the secrets of the American social order. A second secret is the fact that the existence of the establishment, the ruling class, is not supposed to be discussed. Now in the American Oath of Allegiance, we hear 
reference to protecting America from enemies, enemies both foreign and domestic, which implies, does it not, that there can be domestic enemies? Well, we can be sure that there are plenty of domestic enemies. Let's take a look and find out who they are. One of the most powerful of all the secret societies given the agenda and operating in the world is known by the name of the Illuminati. There's terms that they use, these secret societies, and then there's terms that their historians and critics also use, terms that they use within the lodges and terms and names that people on the outside know. But the Illuminati is a very powerful organization. On the left is a picture of its creator, Adam Weishaupt. And Adam Weishaupt, after his passing on, the mantle went to the Italian revolutionary, Giuseppe Mazzini, and Giuseppe Mazzini passed it on to the American Albert Pike, whose picture is on the right there. Albert Pike is the creator of the Scottish Rite Freemasonic system, or at least the bringer to America of the Scottish Rite Freemasonic system. Now, Adam Weishaupt's symbol, the original symbol of the Illuminati, was the pyramid with the eye at the top, and the term New World Order, or Novus Ordo Seclorum, around the bottom of the pyramid. That was the symbol that was found on the documents of the Illuminati and is now on the American $1 bill. The Illuminati was officially founded on May 1st, 1776, and America's official birthday is July 4th, 1776. Interestingly, Adolf Hitler's second book was called The New World Order. Now this term, New World Order, is found at the bottom of the pyramid. It is another secret society slogan. It is not a political slogan. Adolf Hitler's first book was Mein Kampf, and the second one was The World Order or The New World Order. Now, Masons work in very ingenious ways in order to conceal their identity. If you take the symbol of the pyramid and draw around it, take a ruler and draw around it a six-pointed star or hexagram or Star of David, which is easy to do because the pyramid is already the upward-pointing triangle, you will find that at the vertices, at the apexes of the, the uh, Star of David, that's at the six points, it spells out the word M-A-S-O-N, that's Mason. And of course it shows a pyramid, which Masons build. George Washington is seen here standing in the Masonic Hall with a Masonic G above his head, and he's wearing the Masonic apron. So George Washington and many other elites and uh, presidents and so forth are members of these secret fraternities. Everyone knows about the Lincoln Memorial, but travelers and tourists are not as aware that around the corner from that is a very strange, to say the least, image of uh, George Washington, one of the founding fathers. He's seen here naked to the waist, uh, his arms in this uh, mysterious pose. Of course, it's mysterious to tourists. It's not mysterious to members of secret societies because they would recognize this pose. It is an occult symbol. Here is the god worshipped by the Knights Templars, Baphomet. Open any book on the occult and you'll usually see this symbol of the deity stripped to the waist with the hands in that pose. Baphomet is the god of the Freemasons and of the Rosicrucians. Here's an image of uh, Baphomet with the rose cross and the serpent on the globe being worshipped by the members of the fraternity. And in the book of Acts, we have a reference to uh, Satan. I am the offspring of the serpent nature and a corrupter's son. I am the son of he who sits upon the throne and has dominion over the creation beneath the heavens. So the serpents have dominion over the heavens and over the earth. Here is the original symbol that was meant to be on the dollar bill before they came up with the eagle. It was actually a triangle surrounded by serpents. America, America, as we saw earlier, is literally the land of the serpents. They probably thought that would be too obvious and settled for um, other symbols instead, like the eagle. Here is the first U.S. flag, which shows the stars, again, Sirius, and the all-seeing eye radiating outward. So the eye, the Freemasonic symbols of the stars and the all-seeing eye and the pyramidical shape were very much in the minds of the original founding fathers. Now the number 13 appears on the dollar bill quite a lot. 
There's 13 uh, levels of the pyramid. And the 13, which appears on the dollar bill, refers directly to the serpent. In the book of Revelations, it's chapter 13, that the dragon and his destructive power are introduced. But that destructive power involves the use of money. In Revelation 13, it says, He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or upon his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, the Declaration of Independence was signed by 56 men, over 50 of whom were Masons, some Grand Masters. Their original meeting place was none other than the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston, which Daniel Webster said was the headquarters of the American Revolution. So the whole of the American Revolution starts in a tavern which bears the name the Green Dragon. We wonder if that Green Dragon uh, was swallowing a human being. Now, all cults, all fraternities, all churches, all denominations have their symbols. We know the symbols and we know the, what we're looking at, whether it's a church, a synagogue, a mosque, whether it's a policeman, or whether it's a fireman, or whether it's a nurse. We know things by their symbols. So fascism, what are the symbols of fascism? One might think it's the swastika. Actually, it is not. The symbols of international fascism are much older than that. And the key symbol, the cardinal symbol of the fascist movements of the world, is a bundle of rods with a hatchet in the middle of them. This is called the fasce, or the fasces. It's an old Roman symbol, but it even predates the Romans. Where do we find it? On the back of the Congress room. The Freemasonic monopoly of government positions continued for at least the first hundred years of United States history. According to a 1924 census, even in that year, the Senate had a membership which was 60% Freemason. But what worries me more is why, of all the symbols that you could possibly choose, the symbols for international fascism are there in the Senate room at the back. Now, James W. Wardner, in his book on Holy Alliances, says, Our first president was a Mason, sworn into office by the Grand Master of New York on a Bible taken from a Masonic altar, that of St. John's Lodge No. 1. The Bible used in the ceremony was brought there by John Morton, Marshal of the Day from St. John's Lodge of which he was the worshipful master. Thus was laid the cornerstone of our country and forever of our government. This same Bible, used for Washington's inauguration, was used to swear in Masonic presidents Warren Harding in 1921 and Dwight Eisenhower in 1953. And what the good doctor fails to tell you is that when George Bush, in more recent times, asked for his Bible, he specifically asked for three Bibles, the Masonic Three, and laid his hand on three Bibles, and that is another known Masonic symbol. Well, if you got allegiances, you certainly have. George Washington, here is another statue of George Washington, and the caption under the bust, under the name, says Freemason and First President. Now, I don't know about you. In fact, I'm not even an American citizen. I'm from Ireland. But yet I would take offense to that statement. Because what does it say? Let's read it together. It says, George Washington, Freemason and First President. Now, maybe it's just me, but perhaps that should be the other way around. But no, these chaps have allegiances. And you see, that's the problem. That's the conundrum with domestic enemies. If you've got allegiances behind the veil, then what good are your promises and your allegiances in the public domain? If you have your fingers crossed behind your back, so to speak, what good are your promises? Well, from their own works, here's a little book uh, that Freemasons use. This is just one of their little uh, manifesto books that they're all given. It's called The Duncan's Ritual. The Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry. It's given to uh, neophytes so that they can learn about their rituals. And it's uh, full of interesting pictures to show them what to do when they're in the lodge. Books that they're all given. It's called The Duncan's Ritual. The Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry. It's given to uh, neophytes so that they can learn about their rituals. And it's uh, full of interesting pictures to show them what to do when they're in the lodge. And in books just like this one, in the Duncan's Ritual, you find um, captions like this. You find instructions. And you find oaths. 
I will aid and assist a companion royal archmason when engaged in any difficulty and espouse his cause, whether it be right or wrong. A companion royal archmason's secrets shall remain as secure and inviolable in my breast as in his own. Murder and treason not accepted. Here at the G7 summit, you've got the whole picture in one. You've got the Illuminati pyramid in the center with its spokes radiating out. And who are the gang of criminals sitting around it? We've got Francis Mitterrand, we've got Bill Clinton of America and Tony Blair and um, other minions of the Atlantean warlocks. And the G, the G7, the G8. The G is the famous Masonic G, seen on every Masonic lodge. And what is a summit? A summit meeting, a peak meeting. We're meeting on the floor of the house. These are Masonic terms. Pick up a book on it and find out.